presented by Jesus on the 11th of November 2013 in Austin, Texas, USA. This is session two. Now, this trapped emotion is what blocks us from any different truth from entering us. So you can tell yourself over and over, you can tell your mind, I am worth, I am worth something, I am worth something, I am worth something. But as soon as somebody treats you a certain way, you go, you're treating me like I'm worthless and you're angry and everything. Why is that? Because you actually feel you're worthless, otherwise you wouldn't get so angry. Right? Automatically, we revert to the emotion. Automatically. Because whatever you tell your mind is not going to change you. Now, we have historical proof of this single fact. You look at almost every religious faith, every religious faith almost says it was constructed for the point of love. Right? And yet, when you look at the results of most religious faiths, what do you see? Violence instead. You look at the history of the Christian religion, mostly violent. The history of the Muslim religion, mostly violent. The history of most religions are mostly violent. Right? And the reason for that is, is that we have these beliefs in us that all we've got to do is trigger them and whatever was in our mind, so you can even have a Buddhist belief that you know you should love everybody and Zen out and love everybody, but as soon as the emotion is triggered, bang, you don't love anybody anymore. You feel angry and you want to kill somebody. And and this is the this is the problem with this concept that you can change your mind. Your mind is only capable of changing when there is no emotional impediment to the change. And while you have a soul-based belief system in your soul that existed from the time of two, three, four years of age, nothing you tell your mind is going to get to your soul about that particular belief if it's contrary. The only way for, that to, for, only way for change to occur, even in your own mind, is that that belief system is rubbed out from your soul by experiencing it. The, when we start experiencing it, we start dribbling it out. Oops, that looks a bit like a... <laughs> looks a bit like a wee there. We start dribbling it out. Right? And when we dribble the emotion out, we are now in the process of changing the belief. Right? And once you imagine, as you dribble it out, obviously the emotion starts coming out, starts coming out, and more and more of it comes out, and eventually it disappears. Once it disappears, if somebody tells you you are worthy, can you see your mind now has the capacity to absorb it? But not only does your mind have the capacity to absorb it, now your soul has the capacity to absorb it. Because there is not an opposing emotion within your soul. Does it make sense? Right. Now, so the only way we can progress forward is by feeling the false belief of our childhood, which we believe is true. That's the only way to progress forward. That is what the majority of people who have heard divine truth are not doing. They hear divine truth and they go, so I've got to tell myself that I'm worthy. But God's way is, feel that you're unworthy first and then you'll be able to tell yourself you're worthy and it will actually enter you. <laughs> Does that make sense? So we're trying to skip over the unworthy feeling because it's, as was pointed out earlier, it's painful so we, in our attempt to avoid our pain we only want to feel good or we want to be numb we don't want to feel the pain but the emotional belief that I'm unworthy is a painful emotional belief so instead of feeling that pain we tell ourselves the way to change is to not feel that pain which results in the pain remaining within our soul like a big black gooey muck in this case right remains within our soul and we tell ourselves that it's going to be too painful to experience that emotion but the problem is no matter what belief system enters us 
it will never fully enter us because it cannot while that belief, opposite belief exists. That opposite belief will determine everything that happens. And you can listen to divine truth for 20 years and it, you will make no change unless you choose to experience some of this childhood pain. No change can actually happen. Yeah. Mary? Uh, I'm hoping you can help me to explain a feeling that I'm having about this. Yeah. That is, again, from my experience. When I didn't challenge the childhood belief with any truth, mm -hmm. with any divine truth, mm -hmm. I lived in it and mm -hmm. it directed my life. So, so you're saying if there was no challenge... Mm -hmm. of the false belief, shall we call the childhood belief now? Yeah. And remember the false belief, even though it's false from God's perspective, you think it's true. So it's, it's a belief you believe is true, even though God knows it's false. Okay. So when I didn't challenge it, it directed my life. I, had, I created more and more addictions... Because you, know, you now live in. Yeah. So the, the feeling of the hope, false belief. The hopelessness, for example. I yeah. had hopelessness, and so I just lived in this false belief. Yeah. And then I heard divine truth. Yes. And then I tried to feel childhood pain yeah. in order to avoid hopelessness. In, other, in, order, in order to avoid the false belief that was inside of you. Yes. Yeah, that's very complicated, isn't it? It, it is. Because it doesn't work. It doesn't work at yeah. all. Um, that's, why I'm, that's why I want to bring it up. I'm like, yeah. don't do this one. It's not, <laughs> but it doesn't work. There's this other thing that we can do, which is to remember divine truth and let it, the only way I can think of describing it is like letting it, buffet or confront at the false belief that's living inside of me. Correct. So uh, now what works for me is to say, I know this is true, yep. so, but my God, I don't feel it. I feel and Can I even hopeless. revise that? Yeah. The reality is whatever you hear, you don't know is true until you feel it. So stop telling yourself, like, I hear conversations between people who have heard divine truth for years and they say, I know that God loves me. You know, you'd be better off saying, I have no idea God loves me, actually. Mm -hmm. The feeling I have is that I've got no idea God loves me. And what you think you know, you don't know until you feel, right? And unless you feel God loves you, you don't know. So stop telling yourself you know when you're not feeling it. Does that make sense to everyone? Just tell yourself the truth. The mm -hmm. truth is... I don't feel God loves me. Feel that. That's the false belief that needs to be felt. Yeah, because I see people hearing it and then saying, I don't feel God loves me, but if I feel some pain about this one little thing that happened and have a cry, then, then I'll get God's love and I'll avoid this huge whopping great feeling, which is I don't feel that God, God loves me. me. So and how can, how can there be a true prayer for God's love while inside of yourself you have a feeling that God doesn't love you? You're not going to feel that you want God's love if you feel God doesn't love you. That's reality, isn't it? Like, do you want to get love from someone who you believe doesn't love you in the first place? Of course not. Yeah, so it's sort of like how I see and I know I tried to do it, trying to feel things in order to avoid these great whopping black kind of feelings. false beliefs well, feelings they're feelings. from childhood our childhood feelings. of like God yeah. is not real I am alone, it is hopeless all of those ones yes. and it's only since I started feeling those ones that any progress gets made Yeah, happened. Yeah. spot on yeah. and this is what I feel the majority of people still don't understand is that unless you choose to actually feel the feeling that is the false belief inside of you you will not, no matter how much you try, change anything. You will not change anything. And the reason, there is a good reason for that, is that w the soul is made in such a way that while a false belief resides within you, 
it first must be released in order for the truth to enter. Now, I ha my, and Mary have done a whole series of interviews, and I did some with Luli, about how the human soul functions. Some of you would have seen those, right? My suggestion is to go over and over and over and over and over those. Because how the human soul functions is that nothing new can enter your soul. It can enter your head, but not your soul, until the opposite belief on the same subject is released from the soul. And the way it, a, a belief gets released is to feel it. That's how it gets released. The only reason why it's still within you is because it wasn't felt at the time. So when you were ch children and you had this terrible feeling that you, weren't, you were worthless, you weren't allowed to feel it. Your parents did all sorts of things to shut that down. They either told you you are worthy when you didn't feel you were or they reinforced that you're not through their actions towards you. Right? They stopped you from feeling the emotion. And it's only by feeling the emotion that you'll release it. You can only release emotions. You can't release beliefs any other way. That's God's way. Does that make sense? God's way is that you must release the underlying cause of your false belief. And that is a feeling, it's not a thought. Most of these feelings got created before you even had your developed mind. So that should tell you that they aren't thoughts, they're feelings that are controlling you. Feelings that, are, uh, that you believe are true but from God's perspective, they're actually false. But you believe they're true because that has been the truth of your experience in this life. And you need to feel the truth of your experience in this life if you are ever going to progress. Everyone get that? Now, I think that's probably a good place to stop for the moment because that's... I feel, in fact, that in some ways, that's probably all we need to talk about today. Because, because what I would love you to experiment with now is actually listing down what you actually feel from your childhood. So what I would encourage you to do is to make some lists of what you actually feel from your childhood rather than what you want to believe from your childhood. Is that, you see the difference? Make a list of what you actually feel, that you know you actually feel. So, for example, if you actually feel things like that God doesn't love me, write that down. God doesn't love me. God never rescued me, write that down. I wanted rescue, God never rescued me. Mum hated me, write that down. Dad, you know, couldn't give us stuff whether I lived or died, write that down. Right, whatever you feel, these are the feelings that are opposing the truth from entering your soul. So the best thing to do is to write them down. Right? And then what we can do is start seeing the relationship between those feelings and the addictions you've created to make those feelings go away. Does that make sense? So you start to see, okay... To get rid of this dad doesn't love me feeling, what I finished up doing as I grew up is I wanted every man who ever met to love me. And what I finished up doing, you know, if, I, if I'm a woman, what I finished up doing was projecting sexually at them, you know, having sex with them so they'd give me a cuddle afterwards and that way I'd feel a bit of love. Right? And that's the reason, you know, that's one of the things I did just because I, I really feel like dad didn't love me. And I did, did it for that reason. And you see the relationship between what you've been doing in your addiction and what feeling from your childhood you've been avoiding in that process. Do you see? Now, Mary and I do this very frequently because it's not always easy to just feel in the moment, right? Sometimes you've got to allow yourself through a process to become aware of the actual belief that's inside of you. And unless you're aware, you're not going to feel it. 
So if you're trying to shut it down and not be aware at all, you're not going to feel anything there. So, so allow yourself to become aware. So this is what I suggest is our next question that we want to ask ourselves. Okay? What have I done Actually, I might put two here. I'm sorry, for those of you who have already written that down. Number one. Um, what do I believe from my childhood? That's number one. What do I believe from my childhood? Because remember, it's the false beliefs or the actual beliefs from your childhood that are false from God's perspective that have to be felt before you can release them. Now, the thing that's preventing us from releasing these false beliefs is our addictions. So the second question is, what do I do to avoid feeling the childhood belief. Can you see the relationship? So here is what do I believe and be honest with yourself. It's, you know, this is a personal exercise. It's pointless trying to say, tell yourself, I believe God loves me when the feeling inside of you is, I believe God hates me. You know, it's, so write down as many that you come to your mind. You know? What do you believe about your mum really? What do you believe about your dad really? What do you feel? What did you feel from them really? What do you think you felt from them? It doesn't matter if you, they actually did it even. What was the result inside of you that caused you to feel these particular things? Allow yourself to be honest and truthful about them. What do I believe from my childhood? And what do I do now, basically, to avoid feeling that childhood belief? So let's say, I believe that I'm always alone might be one of my childhood beliefs. Because when I was a child, I was always left alone. And nobody ever took any notice of me. Nobody ever listened to me. I finished up reading most of my life away when I was a child. Uh, you know, I hardly had any friends. I was always alone. So that might be my belief. So what do I do now to avoid that belief? Avoid the feeling of it. So what do I do now to avoid feeling alone, in other words? Does that make sense? And you might find yourself that you spend a lot of time in people's company. You go out to watch movies. You play video games. You, you know, all of these things to keep you busy keep yourself busy, you do a lot of exercise, you know, just to avoid the feeling of being alone. Does that make sense? And when you look back at your life, you might find, in fact, while you felt alone as a child, you might find that as an adult, you've never been alone for longer than a day. Many adults find that. You know, they've left one relationship and within a day they've found another uh, often it's that intense that we go from one relationship to another to another to another to another in a moment in moments just to avoid a feeling in fact some people tee up the next relationship before they leave the ne last one in other words they get the next one started before they leave the last one so they don't have to feel alone in between right so so we need to ask ourselves these two questions i feel and what I would love to discuss with you the next time you and I get together, which will be uh, Wednesday, uh, probably, is I would like to discuss these two things, what you found out during this process. What, see, here, these, I would put in brackets as to what these are. These are your addictions. Does that make sense? They are the things that you've created in order to avoid these things.
these painful things? So the first one's the beliefs and the second one is the addictions, basically, that help you avoid feeling the truth of that belief. And when I say the truth of that belief, what you believe to be true inside of yourself. So many of you believe inside of yourself that you're worthless. So what have you done to avoid the feeling of feeling worthless? Right? For, for, for some of you, it would be, oh, I've projected it. Every man, because my feeling of worthlessness comes from my, not having a father, I projected it. Every man may find me sexually attractive in order to validate me. That's one of the ways that I get my feeling of worthlessness overcome. To, does that make sense? So that's my addiction. My addiction is project sexually, get a sexual response. Now I feel valid. I don't have to feel that my daddy didn't love me. I feel men, all, all men love me. <laughs> That's the feeling. Right? And I'm bartering. I'm, I've got these addictions in play. Most addictions, by the way, are codependent. You've heard of that term? That means that you're doing something to please someone else and getting something in response back to you. Most addictions form a codependence, codependency. Okay. Good day. So do you reckon you can have a go, have a stab at that exercise? Remember the underlying goal of this exercise is to show you what is covering over your childhood belief systems. So if I drew a little map of that, basically this is what it looks like. Here are your childhood beliefs that you do not wish to feel These are also, you could classify as your fears. Can you see that? You could classify them as your fears. And over the top of that, to stop you from having to feel those, you've created a whole set of actions, thoughts, People, places, things, and I could list many other things which we'll go through when we start talking about our addictions, to suppress double P the having to feel those emotions. And these are called your addictions. So in other words, you created a whole series of addictions and their purpose. Their primary purpose of all of your addictions is to suppress or push down the emotions that form your childhood belief systems that are painful. Does that make sense? That's the purpose of them. So the addictions are suppressing your childhood beliefs. So if we're going to unravel this process that occurred in our childhood, we're going to need to feel about and acknowledge and even be able to intellectually identify, probably before we acknowledge, if we can intellectually identify these childhood belief systems and start to feel them, what do we find then? We start to feel the reasons why our addictions got created. And once we start seeing the relationship, we can start going, okay, here are my childhood belief systems that I do need to eventually feel. But what I need to do is also see what addictions that I've created that push them down from being felt. The things that control them from being felt. The things that help me avoid them being felt. Right? And once, I'm doing, once I understand the relationship, I can go, okay, here's my addiction in play again. So I might be out doing something, you know, here's my addiction in play. Like, let's look at a very simple addiction. Most of the time I might feel cold. That's the childhood feeling. Right? Just cold. I always feel cold. Always feel cold. That's my childhood feeling. What do I do now to make this cold go away? You know, I turn up the air conditioner to 80. Right? My whole family complains. It's all too hot in here. It's all too hot in here. No, it's not. It's comfortable. You know, there's all these family-based arguments about the fact that I've got the air conditioner turned up. Just a simple addiction to get over this childhood feeling that you're cold. Just one simple feeling. What does cold make you feel? 
fear and alone and a lot of other types of feelings, right? That's why you turn the air conditioner up. That's why you got it set at 80. Right? And you'll start seeing that there's physical things you do, there's emotional things you do, there's spiritual things you do, there's sexual things you do in order to avoid these childhood feelings. And you'll start seeing the relationship then between them. And what we're attempting to do through this process is deconstruct the process that was created so that we can at least start to get to the feeling of these childhood beliefs. That's our goal, to f eventually feel them. We want to feel them. Because if we don't feel them, we will never release them. So our whole goal in this process is to try to get to feeling them. You're not going to be able to feel them initially because you've got all of the addictions pushing down the feeling. Does that make sense? But we've at least got to identify some of these childhood belief systems, these childhood feelings, and what we do to keep them under control. To keep them under wraps. We've got to do that. Because if we don't do that, what we're going to do is never feel them. And remember, you grow by releasing the thing. That it, and the only way to release it is by feeling it. And then a new feeling can enter you. Or a new truth can enter you. Or new faith can enter you. You see, at the moment, as we listed, even our faith is all upside down at the moment. We've got faith in everything that God says is untrue and faith in nothing that God says is true. And the only way to deconstruct that process is by feeling some things. We're going to have to feel what is the untruth that we believe is true. And the only way our faith will change is by feeling something. We've got to understand everything is going to be solved through feeling something. At some point we've even got to get to that belief. At the moment most of us don't even believe that. Can you see? Most of us believe you feel something, you're going to get in trouble. Feel something, dangerous. Feel something, it's going to get hopeless. Feel something, it's going to go over and on forever. Feel something, that's our beliefs. So let's know what those beliefs are and let's look at what we do to keep those beliefs from being felt. What actions we take. Just simple actions to complicated actions that we take to avoid the feeling. Does everyone see the relationship? So I'm sorry to labour that point if I was labouring it for you, but I wanted you to understand why we're going through this process and why we're trying to go through this process. This is a process that Mary and I do every single day. Right? Every single day. We go through this process of looking at what our childhood feelings and beliefs are and looking at what addictions we have that suppress that. Because then we can start deconstructing our addictions and once we deconstruct our addictions, what's going to probably happen? The feeling will just come up naturally. The feeling will just pop out because we've de deconstructed enough addictions to enable the feeling to come out. While you're living in your addictions, no feelings will come out. It's a very important thing to understand. While you're living in your addictions, no feelings will come out. So the only way to have feelings come out, and remember that it's the feelings coming out that heal you. The feelings coming out change you, so you have to have feelings coming out before change will actually happen. But the only way that is going to happen is by you deconstructing the addictions enough so that the feelings can just pop out. Just like that. And that is just like that oftentimes. Like you can, go, you can go on for months and months and months deconstructing addictions and you think, well, this is not getting me anywhere. I still feel much the same thing. And then all of a sudden you're bawling your eyes out and you don't have any idea why. And then, you know, a, a day later you feel completely different. And that's generally how most people experience change with regard to accepting God's truth. Does that make sense? The feelings just pop out when you've done enough work to, to look at your addictions. Now, can I point out to you why this is the case? Your addictions 
are the exercise of your will to deny. That's what addictions are. Addictions are the exercise of your will to deny your childhood emotional experiences. So can you see why it's so much a part of receiving God's love? If you're exercising your will to deny and God's love is trying to expose rather than deny, can you see you're exercising your will in direct opposition to what God's love would do? That's why we need to come face to face with our addictions at some point. Because our addictions are the exercise of our own personal will in a direction that's completely opposite to growing in love and truth. It's the way we're saying to God, no, I'm not doing it your way. I'm doing it my way. This is my way. This works. I know this works from my past experience. I'm not changing. And there's the exercise of your will. The exercise of your will. There's your prayer. Your prayer is, don't you change me. I know what's right. That's your prayer. That's your actual prayer. Remember, it doesn't matter what you think you're praying. What matters is what's coming out of your heart, your soul. And if what's coming out of your soul is, no, I want to maintain these addictions because they're the only things I believe in. And that's what's coming out of your soul. That's the prayer that you, God hears. God hears you don't want to confront your childhood emotional experience. So God says, no worries. I'll try and find some alternative way to help you confront your childhood emotional experience. Right? And God can strike a whole heap of laws, law of cause and effect, law of attraction, many other laws, all to help construct, you know, get to your childhood emotional experience. And now you've got to rely on all them. And most of us don't even rely on them. We're, we're trying to avoid them too, right? So, so this is what we need to understand is that our addictions are the exercise of our will to deny. So the more you can reduce your addictions, the more you're expressing your will to no longer deny. Eventually it becomes such a big prayer within you that, that you notice them very, very rapidly and they disappear because you're willing to feel what created them very rapidly. Eventually that's what happens. Uh, but it's not going to happen without you changing the direction of your will. And that's why I suggest to go through this process. It's a process that Mary and I go through, as I said, all the time. We're just constantly looking. We know that whenever we exercise our will to deny, that's what restricts our growth. Yep. Okay. Thanks for your time today, guys. Okay.